Um, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to uh, talk to you all here today um, and to share our research findings. I'm going to be presenting the results um, from a study led by Professor Susan Glomdock. There is a team of researchers that have worked on this study since it began over 10 years ago, and I've been involved in it from the beginning. The project started around the turn of the new millennium and is looking at parenting, parent-child relationships and child outcome in families created using assisted conception, specifically egg donation, sperm donation and surrogacy. And today I'll be focusing on the data from families of children born using egg and sperm donation. So over the years, um, we have published the findings that I'm presenting today as journal articles, um, and here are a few of them. Further details of what I'll be talking about today can be found in these publications, and there are more publications available on the Centre for Family Research's website. I just want to begin by giving a very brief summary of how gamete donation works in the UK. At the time we recruited partic participants uh, to the study, anonymous sperm donation was available from clinics. You could use known donors, for example family members or friends, but the vast majority of couples were using anonymous donors. It wasn't until 2004 that the law to remove donor anonymity came into force. So now all donors donating at UK clinics have to be ID release, um, that is they have to be open to being contacted by the child when the child reaches the age of 18 years. Likewise, a child can apply for identifying information about their donor when they reach the age of 18 years. It is not possible in the UK to make contact with an ID release donor before the age of 18. So the children in our study were born before this change in legislation. These children can, however, join a registry run by the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority, which is open to children born after 1st of August 1991, the date that the HFEA came into force. But again, the children have to be aged over 18 to join, and will only be able to obtain their information about their donor's identity if the donor has re-registered as being identifiable. We recruited our, our original sample of 50 egg donation families and 51 sperm donation families from nine fertility <coughs> clinics in the United Kingdom. We invited two parent heterosexual couples with a child aged between 9 and 12 months to take part in our study. The non-ART group was recruited through maternity wards and certain selection criteria had to be met. For example, mothers had to be aged over 30 and the pregnancy had to be planned. All the donor insemination children and 36 egg donation children were conceived using an anonymous donors. Families were visited at five time points when the child was aged one, two, three, seven, and then most recently at the age of ten. At all ages, families were visited at home and tape-recorded interviews were carried out with the parents to assess quality of parenting and parent-child relationships and a subsection of the interview focused on the experiences of gamete donation. Parents were also asked to complete questionnaires. At the later ages of 7 and 10 years, we carried out an observational assessment of the parent and the child interacting together, and we also interviewed the children themselves. We also asked the child's teacher to complete the Strengths and Difficulties questionnaire, which is an assessment of the child's psychological well-being. At age one, we assessed parents' quality of parenting, their feelings about their parental role, and their enjoyment of parenting. These variables took into account information obtained from the entire interview, and were coded using strict coding criteria. The quality of parenting consisted of four components, which have been found to be associated with children's well-being. These were expressed warmth, emotional over-involvement, parent-child interaction, and sensitive responding. Expressed warmth was based on the parent's tone of voice, their facial expressions, and their spontaneous expressions of warmth, sympathy, and concern about any difficulties experienced by the child. Emotional over-involvement measured the extent to which the family life and the emotional function of, of the child was centred on the child, and the extent to which the parent was over-concerned or over-protective of the child. Parent-child interaction measured the extent to which the parent and the child spent time together enjoyed each other's company and showed affection to one another. 
Sensitive responding measured the mother's ability to recognise and respond appropriately to the child's needs. Feelings about parental role assessed feelings about being a parent. And the enjoyment of parenting measured the expressed enjoyment as well as reservations about being a parent. So in terms of our findings, at age one we found no differences between gamete donation mothers and fathers in their psychological health or marital quality. In terms of parenting, we found that gamete donation mothers showed higher levels of warmth to their child and enjoy enjoyment of parenthood compared to the control group of non-ART parents and that they showed greater emotional involvement than the non-ART mothers. No differences were found in other measures of parenting. The fathers from gamete donation families were also found to show greater involvement than non-ART fathers, but few other differences were found. No differences were found in infant temperament, which was assessed using a questionnaire assessment called the Infant Characteristics Questionnaire. Thus, overall, findings from age one showed few differences, and where differences were found, these indicated better parent-child relationships for gamete donation families. We used a different interview at age two, called the Parent Development Interview. This interview is derived from attachment theory and is based on the view that parents' thoughts and feelings about their child influences parenting behaviour. Unlike the interview used at age one, which asks parents to describe their child and their relationship, the parent development interview asks parents to describe their own and the child's experiences during specific moments of interaction. So for example, the parent is asked to describe the child's reaction to normal separations, routine upsets and parental unavailability followed by questioning that addresses the parents' behavioural and emotional responses to these different situations. In this way, the parents' experiences and representations of the dynamics of the relationship between themselves and the child can be evaluated. The interview is coded using a coding manual, and ratings are made on a number of variables related to the parents' affective experience and the child's affective experience. Again, we asked parents to complete questionnaires, and we also assess the child's cognitive development using the mental scale of a standardised assessment tool called the Bailey Scale of Infant Development. At age two, findings were generally similar to those at age one. That is, overall, we found no differences between gamete donation families and non-ART families. The few differences we did find was found in the, on the questionnaire called the Vulnerable Child Scale, which showed that gamete donation mothers viewed their child as more vulnerable than non-ART mothers. Also, some of the variables on the parent development interview show differences. Gamete donation mothers showed higher levels of joy and pleasure than non-ART mothers, and the egg donation mothers scored higher on this than the donor insemination mothers. Higher levels of overprotectiveness among donor insemination than egg donation mothers was also found. No differences were found between fathers in each group. And once again, no differences were found in the child's socio-emotional development and their cognitive development. At age three, we used an interview similar to that used at age one. 41 DI mothers, 41 egg donation mothers, and 67 non-ART mothers were interviewed. Once again, at age three, we found few differences. We did again find that gamete donation mothers scored higher on warmth to the child and higher on mother-child interaction both of these indicating better parenting amongst gamete donation mothers. No differences were found for the child's psychological adjustment. So overall, findings from these first three phases of the study showed that gamete donation families were doing well. And in some cases, their parenting was rated as being better than non-ART families. This may be because parents who use gamete donation have often experienced years of infertility treatment and so it is perhaps unsurprising that when they finally become parents, they are highly committed in their role. One of the areas um, of our data that we are focusing on now is looking at the longitudinal data we have and examining changes over time. One area we have examined is the psychological adjustment of children born using egg donation and donor insemination from age 3 to age 10. Children's psychological adjustment was measured at age 3, 7 and 10 using the Strengths and Difficulties questionnaire completed by mothers. The questionnaire produces a total score of the child's behaviour difficulties from subscales that relate to emotional symptoms, conduct problems, hyperactivity in attention and peer problems. High scores on this questionnaire represent greater difficulties. 
At age 7 and age 10, we also asked the child's teacher to complete the same questionnaire, and we found modest agreement between the mother's and the teacher's reports. We also used interview data on mother's quality of parenting and questionnaire assessments of marital quality, depression and anxiety, so that we were able to assess positive aspects of parenting, negative aspects of parenting and psychological distress. So according to what we know about children's psychological health, we would expect an improvement in their well-being over time. So we looked at the data and found that children's psychological adjustment for the non-ART groups did, as expected, improve over time. However, for the DI and egg donation groups, psychological adjustment remained stable over time. For parenting variables, the DI mothers did not differ from non-ART mothers on parenting or mother's psychological well-being. For egg donation mothers, positive aspects of parenting were higher than the non-ART group but they did not differ for negative aspects of parenting or for psychological well-being. This higher level of maternal positivity shown by egg donation mothers may possibly be associated with their older age and the greater likelihood of having a singleton child. The issue of whether or not children are told about their conception and how this knowledge or lack of knowledge affects their development has become an increasingly interesting area of research. In the past, the majority of families didn't tell the child, and so looking at the impact of disclosure was not possible. With the relatively recent move towards disclosure and the wider recognition that children should be told about their conception, we are finding that more of the parents in our studies are telling their child about their conception. So we were able to compare the data from families who had disclosed to those who had not. So we re-ran the analysis by dividing the gamete donation families into two groups, those who had told the child about their conception and those who had not. We then compared these new groups of disclosed versus non-disclosed families to the non-ART group. Here, significant improvements in children's psychological adjustment were found again in the non-ART group and in the disclosed families, but not in the non-disclosed groups. Thus, although the findings suggested that children conceived by gamete donation had different developmental trajectories to those from non-ART non children, it seems that, the, the, that it is the gamete donation children who were not informed of their donor conception who showed the less improvement in behaviour over time. <coughs> Thus, where our previous cross-sectional analyses has found few differences between disclosing and non-disclosing groups, longitudinal data analysis appears to suggest that disclosure may be beneficial for child outcome. We also found that mothers in the non-disclosing group scored higher than the non-ART mothers for psychological distress. This finding parallels findings from early studies of adoptive families in which parents kept the child's adoption secret. In those studies of adoptive mothers, it was thought that psychological distress may be a reflection of the raised levels of stress and feelings of lack of entitlement as parents. Keeping secrets has been shown in other research to involve considerable cognitive and behavioural effort, often causing preoccupation with the secret, which could produce psychological distress. Further studies with larger sample sizes are needed to see if these findings are replicated in other samples of donor conception families. I would now like to briefly talk about the pattern of disclosure over the years. So like I mentioned, recent years have seen a shift in people's views over disclosure to the child. Whereas in the past, doctors encouraged parents to keep the birth of the child a secret, now in the UK, they are encouraged to tell the child about their birth. There are also greater resources and support groups available for parents to help with telling their child. There is general, there is general consensus now that openness is the best policy. So what are the families in our longitudinal study doing about telling their child about gamete donation? Looking at what parents said over the 10 years, at age one, we can see that more egg donation parents were intending to tell compared to DI parents. At age three, a small handful of parents had told the child about their conception. At age three, again, more egg donation parents were planning to tell the child compared to donor insemination parents. A higher proportion of DI parents were planning not to tell the child. At age seven, more egg donation and sperm donation families had told the child compared to the earlier years. So most parents were telling their children between the ages of three and seven years. When we had the data at age seven, 
we looked at disclosure patterns over time to see whether intentions to tell or not to tell when the child was aged one was related to what actually happened when the child was aged seven. And so here we can see that at, at age one, 10 um, families, um, DI families said they plan not to tell and five said that they plan to tell. And this generally remained the same for most of them at age seven. Only one DI family had gone on to tell the child and one DI family and one egg donation family was undecided at age seven. For families who were uncertain when seen at age one, about half of DI families had decided not to tell with the remainder still being undecided. For egg donation, fa for, for egg donation families, the outcomes at age seven were more varied. Of those parents who were undecided at age one, two had gone on to tell the child, one was planning to tell, one had decided against telling, and three remained uncertain. For families who had planned to tell when seen at age one, over half had told the child by the age of seven, and most of the others were still planning to tell the child. Only one DI family had said they were no longer going to tell the child. So on the whole, parents' intentions to tell the child remained relatively stable over the years. The undecided group were the most likely to change their minds about telling by age seven, but different patterns were observed for um, DI parents and egg donation parents with more donor insemination parents um, deciding not to tell. The other aspect we were interested in was parents' agreement about whether or not to tell. We usually carry out separate interviews with the fathers and the mothers, and we examined if the responses they gave to the question of whether or not they will tell the child was the same. We found a few instances where different answers were given by mothers and fathers. Discrepancies between parents occurred most often when one parent was coded as being uncertain. Sometimes they would be uncertain because they knew that they didn't agree with their partner's decision on whether or not to tell. So for example, one egg donation mother said, I would be more likely to talk to the child, maybe not now but in a couple of years time, and talk it through with him. But I don't think my husband wants to do that. He doesn't want him to know anything. But I don't know, I'd have to ask my husband. I think we have a lot of talking to do about it. We also found cases of partial disclosure to the child, where the parent reports having told the child, but where further questioning by the interviewer reveals that although they may have told their child about IVF, they hadn't mentioned using donor gametes. For example, well, we've told him that he's an IVF baby, but we weren't telling him what the problem was. We'll only tell him that if the time arose to tell. Often reasons for not telling about donor gametes was because parents felt the child was too young. But even with other aspects of disclosure, we found parents disclosing partial information only. So for example, telling their friends that they had IVF or fertility treatment and not mentioning gamete donation. Or in one instance, a mother had told her child about egg donation, but had not disclosed that the donor was someone she and the child knew. And the reason she gave for this is because the donor had wished to remain anonymous. At ages seven and ages 10, we interviewed the children themselves about how they felt about being donor conceived. We found that at age seven, children showed little understanding of their donor conception, but by age 10 years, children were able to talk more, more coherently about the birth. So for example, she had the eggs put into her and then my dad's sperm mixed it up and then I got created. And then she said like about all the particles and stuff that like run about and make stuff. Um, and another child says, my dad couldn't really make the seed, so had a seed from a special man who gave one up. Of those children who talked about their donor conception, most had neutral <coughs> feelings or described their donor conception in a positive way. For example, I'm fine, I don't feel any differently, I'm just carrying on with my life. I don't really think about it much because there's much more special, like cooler things, so I don't really care about it much. <laughs> and another child said, I'm all right, just happy I've got my mum and my dad really. However, some children, children's responses were more mixed or negative. For example, one child from an egg donation family described feeling a little bit strange. When children were interviewed at age 10, they were asked to describe how they felt when they first learnt of their donor conception. Children's responses ranged from feeling amazed or shocked to feeling fine. 
So this child, um, egg donation child, said, just a little bit shocked, really. Yeah, I just didn't realise that it was like that. I thought it was just the normal way of people getting made. And another child said, I was quite happy. It felt a bit strange, like weird, or maybe I didn't understand. Most children reported that they did not discuss their donor conception with their friends, which could be indicative of feelings of discomfort or embarrassment. Um, that's the only secret that I haven't told any of my friends because I don't really want anyone to know. Only four out of 16 children had said that they did talk to other people about their conception. For example, this child had said, Well, at school I've been showing off, but most of my friends, definitely my best friends, yeah, most of my friends at school, about three or four friends, who you know. However, it is possible that donor offspring feel more comfortable talking to friends about this issue as the children grow older. So how do children feel about the donor? At age 10, most of the children expressed feelings of gratitude towards the donor, or described the donor as being kind, nice or generous man. I'm very grateful for him, and I'm very thankful for him. And it's weird that we can't ever meet him, because I thought we could be like friends, be like my mum and dad's friends. And another child said, I don't really think about him. All I do is look at a picture of me and say, that man, the man who helped, must you know, have the same colour of hair or the same colour eyes, so I don't really think about it much. Apart from the few egg donation families that knew their donor, most of the children in our study are born us using anonymous gametes. It is important to see how the children will feel about the fact that they are unable to access any further information about their donor given that children born just five years later will be able to find out the identity of their donor. This will be better understood by following the children as they grow older and gain a deeper understanding of their conception. So, to summarise, our findings suggest that gamete donation families do well and do not differ from non-ART families with regards to parenting and child development. There are indications that disclosure may have beneficial outcomes for gamete donation children. Disclosure itself is not a straightforward process. We are aware, and other studies have also shown, that parents disclose information that is age appropriate for the child, giving the child more information as the child develops a more sophisticated understanding. But our studies are also finding that in some instances, parents are choosing never to disclose all the details of their child's conception opting instead to disclose partial information. This can potentially lead to a problematic scenario where the parent feels that they have been open with the child, but the child is not aware of the whole story. Given that most parents in our study had told at least one other person, for example a family member or a friend, about the details of their child's conception, there remains the possibility of the child finding out from somebody else. For those children who are aware of their conception, most feel positive or indifferent about the birth by age 10. At the age of 10 years, it is possible that children's understandings and feelings about their birth will be a reflection of their parents' narrative. As the children grow older, their own independent understandings will develop. We aim to follow up the children as they enter adolescence, when issues around identity in particular become more salient. We need to be aware uh, of some of the limitations of the study. For example, because of the nature of the study, with it being a longitudinal study, we do have families who we lose to follow up. So we do not know how the families that have not been seen in subsequent phases are faring. All the children in our study were born before the change in the law that removed donor anonymity. So the findings may not be representative of people who are currently accessing gamete donation in the UK. Never nevertheless, the study is the only longitudinal study to be following families that have used gamete donation to have a child. And the findings show that overall, family relationships and children's well-being up to the age of 10 years is not negatively impacted by this route to parenthood. Thank you.